Hey, Inspired Money Maker. Today we're talking about DeFi and ETF index funds. Wait, what? An index fund in the blockchain? <laughs> Episode 236 features Victor Lee, co founder of Dow Ventures, DeFi fund manager. You see, that is the problem with DeFi. There are too many jargons. How we can expect the normal people to understand what is LP, what is taking and liquidity mining? You know, when they, when they listen to that, they are like, I'm not going to participate, right? So that is the problem with DeFi. But anyway, to answer your question, right, um, the range of like the yield in like the staking and the liquidity mining, right, ranges from like a few percent to the crazy one, it could be up to like a thousand percent. They are. But as the golden, olden wisdom, <laughs> The higher, the higher risk you take and the chances that that will actually disappear, right? It's just the same thing. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money podcast and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. This episode is brought to you by Seeking Alpha. Seeking Alpha Premium is a subscription service that gets you everything you need to make smarter investing decisions. Whether you have a portfolio of stocks, ETFs, or mutual funds, Seeking Alpha Premium gives you expert market analysis, proprietary quant ratings, unlimited call transcripts and earnings calls, powerful stock screeners, and more. It's quick and easy to link your brokerage account. With Seeking Alpha quant ratings, author ratings, and Wall Street ratings, you'll immediately get a snapshot that tells you which stocks in your portfolio rank well or those that might require attention. Join over 200,000 subscribers today. I have a special for you too. Use the link inspiredmoney.fm slash alpha for a 14-day trial. You'll get 50% off by buying the annual plan. It's $179.99, which works out to less than $15 a month. Now, let's get on to the show. Today's guest is Victor Lee. Together with Alvin Fu and Sun Lai, Victor founded Dow Ventures, a DeFi robo-advisor and automated money manager based in Singapore. It provides a wide range of crypto ETF DeFi index funds. In this episode, you'll learn an overview of digital currencies and DeFi, how Dow Ventures is trying to make DeFi more accessible with its ETF strategies for fund managers and crypto investors. And stay tuned to the end to hear how Victor manages the volatility of crypto in dealing with bear markets. Now let's get inspired with Victor Lee. Victor, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Um, well, I'm, um, I'm, actually ba I'm actually born in Malaysia. And, um, you know, Malaysia is actually was a developing country in the early days. So my memory childhood of money is, uh, you know, when when I'm young, my parents actually give me some money for me to have allowances for me to go and, you know, consume in my, you know, primary school days at the school, right? So that's my earliest memory of how the money works in my life. How did you spend that money? Candy? Snacks? Street food? What did you eat? You know, basically, when you're at the school, right, generally speaking, you want to spend more on, like, most of it on, like, soft drinks and, like, you know, <laughs> junk foods, right? That's what we do at the young. So, uh, yeah, that's how we actually spend. But, of course, that being said, right, I came, I grew up in a very middle-class family and, like, you know, uh, my mom and my dad is actually uh, both entrepreneurs and, you know, they doesn't have a lot of money to go by. So, I'm actually very... um. Say I'm a saver kind of person. I actually very careful with my money that I how much I spend because you just know I can see the strugglehood of my parents when I'm young. So, but again, being a kid, right, you always wanted to spend it on like soft drinks and buying junk foods, right, at the school. Yeah, that's universal. What what kind of businesses did your parents have, and how did that inform your future to become an entrepreneur yourself? I, I guess, right, entrepreneur is actually more of a choice. And then uh, it's just maybe that kind of like image of how you see um, successful people um, be, um, uh, become, become have driven, right, to, to, to do something and make an impact in their life. Right? So, but for me, um, my, my parents has actually shown me that what it takes to um, create something out of nothing and then the perseverance, the dedication, 
uh, from from their life and their daily energies, right, to make a end living uh, for the for the family and for themselves. And that is actually what makes me uh, to be me today, because I can see that you know being a, a, a business owner and being an entrepreneur create a lot of uh, and make an impact to a lot of uh, people's life. Like for example, the workers, the customers, right. Those are actually some of the earliest memory I have when I look at uh, that that the entrepreneurship journey from and my business from my parents, right? Yeah, so that's how I get into entrepreneurship. But of course, that is not the kicking point, right? Because I was too young to like really understand, uh, you know, how what it takes to be a successful businessman. It's just that after I graduated from my um, university days, that I was like looking for opportunity. And of course, you know, being looking for a job, looking for a role, you know, then I I actually look at my my inspiration hero is actually my uh, my uncle, who is a very successful businessman, right? And of course, he's uh, doing a big business. But again, looking at, again, from nothing, right? He actually created a multi-million dollar empire. Then I just told myself, hey, I want to be like him, right? So there's kind of like a heroic character in my life that I want to mirror upon. And I choose him because he's the earliest guy that I see is actually successful in his uh, empire. Has he given you advice over the years? Of course, uh, some of the early advice is actually more on like uh, how to be a better human, right? And generally, uh, you know, it comes from people who actually understand how to uh, create something and uh, be successful. Of course, he actually gave me a lot of advice about what it takes to, uh, you know, succeed. How do we actually think about, you know, things? Um, you know, how about how about we creating stuff that, uh, you know, meaningful? And of course, how do we treat our family and friends as well? I mean, not only from the business point of view, it's actually more on like the personal character point of view that actually inspire me the most. Because um, from what I see, and even until today, I carry it to my heart, is that successful entrepreneurs are generally, um, majority of them, I, I really believe that, are actually very humble. Successful people are very humble. They have humility to admit that when they're wrong and they know that how to improve on it, and they correct their mistakes and learn and continue again. So those are some of the early days, right? When I see how the challenges face my, my father, my, my mom, and of course, you know, my uncle, right, who are doing business, that give me a lot of um, learning on how do I bring my character up to where I am today. And I think that is actually more important from a businessman point of view, instead of just thinking about money and money and money, right? Because how do we treat our team? How do we treat our customers? How do we treat our, you know, people around us, right? Our stakeholders and friends and families and customers matters because it's just human, right? The more we touch human, the more they believe in what we do. And in a good way, people will tend to like, you know, give us a chance, right? So that's how I learned from you know, all these learnings. Well, it's super interesting because I think that the money can complicate things or magnify weaknesses or problems that one has. So having a good character, whether you have not very much money or you have a lot of money, seems to provide a lot of stability for people and hopefully some kind of sense of happiness and fulfillment. Because I think that there are people who have lots of money they don't have a good character and they're also not happy. <laughs> of course, you know, um, I think one of the other words that I would use, right, is actually integrity because money distorts integrity if you don't have a good foundation. But if you have a good foundation, that integrity goes with you and goes a long way. That reputation that you develop over the years, over your character integrity, right? will actually mirrors what you do in the real life. And that is what I've been carrying in my badge of honor for myself uh, so far. So I take that very seriously right, in terms of the things that I do. Mm, important lessons. Well, I'm very excited to speak with you. You've been a crypto entrepreneur since 2016. You've seen booms, busts, significant growth in that time. Can you give us a quick overview of the different waves and who the winners were? You know, looking back, a little bit of a retrospective. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, um, some little bit background by myself, even though I'm an entrepreneur and I'm of course doing businesses, right? Um, but I'm a technologist, I'm a product manager, and I think like an engineer more than a business person. Uh, I know that because I feel more excited about building stuff and solving problems, creating problems rather than looking at the money. So I know that I'm actually more driven as the product manager and engineer, right? And solving problems, creating cool stuff. So I think uh, being in a new technology, 
uh, actually excites me uh, than you know like just making money right for me um that is my in my blood so that being said uh i i i i, I studied computer science and it right uh, when i was young and i've seen the boom and bust of various technologies so that is what carry me into crypto and that is what makes me stay in crypto cryptocurrency and blockchain technology so to, to start back right before we even talk about like the crypto itself I'll, let's talk a little bit more on technology so i graduated from my university in 1999 that was like the dot-com bust right you know didn't have any job uh, after that right but you can see that right that created the first wave of the internet technologies and then after that of course the search engine of google and stuff right come out to emerge as like the the winner of the internet space right but every cycle up and down there's going to be a new innovation that happened and changed the world. Example, 2000 and early of 2000, uh, 2000s, uh, Facebook started and nobody was talking about social media back then, right? But they created the first social media, social network space. And then today they are the big giants, right? Along the way, at the end of, uh, you know, the, the, the year of 2000s, then you can see that, you know, Steve Jobs announced that the iPhone was launched and the mobility kickstart. Before that, there was mobile phone, right? Nokia, Blackberry, Motorola was like, you know, the dominant space, right? But, you know, Apple just make it kickstart it to the next level. And then from there onwards, multi-billion dollar corporation created because of that movement, right? So because, for example, like on a, on a mobile app space, on a, a mobile app, mobile phone developments, you can see that the age of mobility start to take and conquer right, in the year of 2000s. And of course, during the early days, right, that's why there's a lot of cheap Chinese phone and a lot of uh, new companies created in the Apple ecosystem example right things of companies that actually succeed was like whatsapp exited to 16 billion so to facebook and then there's like instagram so a billion and then like various companies right snapchat back then was still hot but again right these companies created because of mobile phone right age of mobility because of the understanding about how technology works and how the new age of technology will disrupt how we interact with our life and businesses and the world then i realized right when i discovered web3 which is cryptocurrency and blockchain, they realize, holy F, that technology is going to disrupt how we change uh, and operate in the world today. And I, I didn't, I'm not the early adopter in Bitcoin. I, in fact, I actually discovered Ethereum before Bitcoin. So as I mentioned, I'm a more of a product guy. Right? I look at, you know, the blockchain, something that we can build on blockchain to create more transparency, to create a distributed ledger on the blockchain. Wow, that is like cool as hell, man. So. 2016 i went through that and then i because of my understanding of how the internet works social media work mobility works chinese social network e-commerce then i realized cryptocurrency is the future Though, despite the bear market that happened in 2018 which is what you mentioned right the cycles the boom the bull the bear i went into crypto full-time as an entrepreneur in 2018 <laughs> that was the longest bear market in my life but I never give up because I know that this industry is going to change the world and I just need to be there, try to create value, create cool products, solve problems and be in the industry, right? I will be a thought leader someday. And this is demonstrated and mirrored today. So what happened is, uh, you know, I was in that bull market, try to create a startup, you know, being an entrepreneur, create cool products, trying to compete, you know, just being a smart entrepreneur. So of course, bull and bear. And today we are again, right? I think a little bit bearish market. But two years ago, year 2020, you know, the bull market just changed my life and uh, the, the our startup, right? So I'm very grateful for, um, you know, cryptocurrency Web3 by nature because, I, I mean, I changed how I operate on my businesses and stuff just because I stick to it and the bull market came, I'm all prepared. Using like internet 1.0 as the analogy, like you're right, back in 1999, 2000, it was all the promise. It was about eyeballs. It wasn't about earnings, barely about revenues. There were companies that didn't have business models and the stocks were just, you know, it was internet bubble. Yep. It took 10 to 15 years for the real businesses to emerge and to suddenly people are searching Google for every need, right? You need something. You need to buy an appliance. You go to Google. You need to find a professional to hire. You go to Google. It took 10 to 15 years. In Web3, do you think it's happening much faster? Like, where are we in that development cycle? Will it take 10 to 15 years? Or yeah, where are we right now? Again, um, 
I would do not want to generalize because every industry is, every industry and cycle is different. Uh, but there is a pattern to it. I believe that every technology um, will take around a decade for it to hit the the mass market, right? I'm not talking about laggards. I'm talking about, I mean, if there's a chart, right, to show the adoption curve um, that was being shared. Generally, we are still at the early phase, right, whereby, you know, it's the technologies, the innovators, uh, and the cyberpunks, and those people who are interested in this, who are working on this. I think we are actually at the phase of getting adoption, but it's just beginning. Another five years down the road, you'll be at the peak of adoption. Why do I say that? Because I believe that every cycle, right, is going to be like five to 10 years before we can see that the peak, right? And then after that, it's going to be like emergent of the real winner. Uh, at the current space, right, there's going to be winner at every other uh, sector in the blockchain space, right? Of course, there are already some winner here and there, but it doesn't mean that another new winner can't take away it. It's demonstrated. Uh, I can share more examples later, but I think we are just at the start of the cycle whereby we'll get more adoption in the next five years before we reach the peak. After that, yeah, there'll be some real winners, and then most probably the adoption will start to slow down. Again, there will be a new technology again. So I think every five, 10 years, right, there's going to be a new change. And it has demonstrated. Web 1.0 was internet. And it was like 1990s, 2000, right? Then it started to adopt. And then the Facebook, Google, and like by the end of the 2000s, Google has really been the majority of market share of the, uh, you know, the search engine, right? And Facebook win that, uh, um, that social media network. But by then, right, the new technology was Web 2, right? Which is like the mobility, mobile phone, you're carrying your computer on your device. There's a new technology, nobody thought of that, you know, and then it was a start. And then after that, it created a much more uh, multi-billion dollar company. Right? You can see that there's every cycle, every five to 10 years, right? There's a new emergent. But by the 10 years, generally, there's a winner. So I believe that we are in the middle of it right now. So you're betting as an entrepreneur, it's, it's the, you're trying to ride this wave for the next 10 to 20 years and see a significantly different world and be rewarded uh, financially for that, to be a part of that major wave of growth. So when it comes to crypto, like first wave, I don't know, 2014 maybe, Bitcoin was being used for money laundering and like who won in those days? And unfortunately, many people who are not directly involved today, they still look back at two, they're looking back to those days of 2014 and saying crypto is not real because it's dirty money. Mm. Uh, I can explain a bit more about how do we think about the process, right, of the crypto growth. Uh, and also it mirrors what I can see next, right, for the next five years. So cryptocurrency started because of Bitcoin, right? Web3 started because of Bitcoin, because of the distributed ledger technology that happens on the proof of work network started by Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just the currency on the on the blockchain. So what happened is that uh, 2009, when Satoshi Nakamoto published the white paper, and then it was just cyberpunks, right, and like geeks, right, who are like connecting their PlayStation and their access computer to the network, right? And they just mine some cryptos. And during that, well, it's like cost like pennies, right? But in the early days, right? I, I mean, I break uh, crypto into three waves as of today. The first wave was actually what you were mentioning about. Uh, generally, Bitcoin was leading the first wave. Uh, we call it as like the wave 1.0, right? During that, right, um, the crypto and Bitcoin are generally used for money laundering and illicit activities, right? Like, such as uh, Mount Gox and uh, Silk Road, it was got hacked and stuff, right? Those were the early days. And by then, right, you cannot even cash out, right? You're literally just using the currency online, right? And no people understand what's the use for, but you, people are using that to buy some stuff, right? Uh, illegal from the online, dark net and stuff. The second wave started because of Ethereum. You know, Vitalik Batrin just thought of the idea, why don't I create a distributed computer, right? A quantum, com a, 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 a decentralized computer on the blockchain called Ethereum network using the same technology as uh, Bitcoin, which is the proof of work, right? You have a mind for it, but that, com that network itself, the program itself is actually a computer, it's a contract, right? So again, when it started, right, it's just an other currency, you promise to build a computer on chain, but nobody understands what it's that for, right? Uh, that was actually started around 2015. That actually propels to uh, the second wave. What happened was somebody decided that to figure out that they can create something on there called ERC20. <laughs> so essentially what is that, right? They created a subsidiary uh, derivative token that actually happens on the Ethereum blockchain. That is actually the contract uh, called ERC20, right? Um, and it's just a token, right? 
but their token promise you to give you more value for a token. So what happened is that that creates a second wave, which is the ICO, a lot of scam tokens, anybody raising like tens of million, hundreds of million, a billion, right? Everyone changed the world and stuff. That was the second wave. But there's actually winner from the second wave as well, despite so many scams and so many tokens have died. Um, the winners from that stage, right, are actually the exchanges. Because if you look at it, right, today, Coinbase is worth hundreds of billion. Binance is worth like hundreds of billions, right? And it's just a start. As I mentioned, it's just a start, right? And you look at how many exchanges of cryptocurrency in the world today, there's a lot. And they are still profitable and it's just growing. I remember there's an interview by done by CZ from Binance on like a World Economic Forum. He was saying that like three years ago, right, the trading volume per month was like just in the hundreds of million. Today, they are talking about billions per month. It's just the trading volume just went up, right? Just because the market growing with the wave, right? Then they are the market leader for that space. But there are still some other challenges who started two years ago and still become billion. I'm sure you heard of that company called FTX, right? FTX is one of the biggest uh, exchange in the world today. And then after that, uh, they, they, they started uh, in the bear market as well. So anyway, those are the winners of the second uh, wave. The third wave started two years ago when the DeFi summer started. So what happened was, um, again, a company in US found a way to actually attract the liquidity, uh, attract the capital from the centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges and decentralized finance. And that is what kickstart the sector with. And because of that, suddenly everyone realized that, oh, I can start to use the crypto on the blockchain for finance purpose. Before, because before that, right, on the second wave, there's no much of a use case. I have a token. The only thing that I can do is just to trade with you and stuff. I, I, I have no use for the token, right? It's just a piece of token. But third, but the, the wave currently, there is like NFTs. You can want to own something that, uh, you know, like a picture of yours. They still verify on the contract. And then there's going to be like uh, the insurance. You can actually through trading on the blockchain. Then, then you can do derivative product on the blockchain. You can do decentralized exchanges on the blockchain whereby the users could just trade against it, right? So that is the third wave. And now it's slightly down again, a little bit bearish because of the global market condition and of course the Federal Reserve. But the narrative changes all the time. Version 1.0, Bitcoin was used for illicit activities, darknet stuff, illegal stuff. Version 2.0, create new industries, new tokens, new exchanges, right? New chain. The third, in, the third wave, uh, suddenly decentralized finance and NFT actually emerge. And they are the ones that create the most value in this wave. So we are just past uh, the wave three and a little bit down. And the wave four will come again. It's just a matter of time again. And that brings to what I intend to do with my uh, startup for the wave four and five and so on. So tell everyone why you're so excited about the decentralized finance. What are the opportunities? What's the lay of the land today? Well, maybe you can, you gave us this really helpful wave one, wave two, wave three of crypto and blockchain with DeFi. Where are we? Is it 1.0, 2.0 right now? Um, I mean, there's a lot of terminology happening around in the crypto space, right? It's just the innovation here happening at a light speed. Um, but again, it's very excited, right? That is why I'm like, you know, I'm an engineer. I've, I'm very excited about this. But, you know, I'm also a business person and I'm also a product person. So I think currently DeFi is only at 1.0. Of course, there's also DeFi 2.0, but it's just, I think it's a gimmick, right? I think ultimately DeFi 2.0 will happen when it actually merges with the real world. So what will happen for that? What is required for that to happen? I think there are two types of uh, market. One of them is actually for the retail customers, which is people from Robin Hoods who are actually able to invest into DeFi products such as index fund, such as ETF funds on the blockchain, permissionless, easily through a phone. That's where we will see the growth for the next five years for the retail perspective. For the advanced um, DeFi perspective, that is where it will replace. Uh, on the on the advanced uh, DeFi perspective, that is where you're going to replace all the institutional uh, um, elements. For example, right, currently you can see that there's a lot of trading of uh, you know derivatives product uh, on the real world, trading gold, oil, and stuff, but it's not happening on the blockchain yet. It will happen on the blockchain. Why? Because these products and these financial products 
are supposed to trade it globally 24-7. And what's more better tool for that than the blockchain network that doesn't sleep? It happens 24-7, permissionless by anyone in the world as long as they have money and access to it. Unlike the current structure whereby you need to be licensed, fun, you need to have like a big, a pile of money like you know on like the wall street or like you know there's much more barrier to do so but right now the next wave for this advanced stuff right will come from like businesses and uh, fund managers even it could be a bunch of guys right who are very good in mit's create some machine learning they could create some stuff that actually do trading of oil on the contract on the blockchain level in the next five years right and then people around the world will be like hey i just want to trade i don't want to go to pay in us dollar i want to pay in crypto can it be done yes it's still money, right? So I think in the next five years, this is where the wave will come. The retail market is going to be going in and just, hey, I, instead of buying on Robinhood, which is a centralized entity, now I can buy it on a blockchain with my phone. And then another one is that's the advanced uh, trading, right? On those advanced trade, trade uh, advanced financial products on the blockchain. And I think it's just started. So for the next five years, right, it's going to be very exciting how this industry will go. As a financial advisor, I don't know that I'm very excited about the 24-hour trading, but I know it's coming. There's already, you know, like pre-market trading for stocks and after-market hours. And I know that crypto is just trading internationally all the time. I, I need to get over that. <laughs> <laughs> but I like when markets close and I you can sleep a little bit better knowing the things are not moving as much while you're sleeping. Can you talk a little bit about DeFi protocols and really the opportunity for investors, whether professional or retail, to truly make passive income? Yes, of course. Um, you know, it sounds a little bit like Ponzi, right? But again, it is happening, right? Um, a lot of people are aware of it. There's a lot of professional fund managers who deploy their capital on crypto and they get massive yield, massive uh, ROI, or right? passive income. So for ex example, right? If you're holding US dollar note today uh, and you deposit in a bank, a commercial bank or any other banks or financial institution, generally speaking, the interest you give you yield you like 0.1% or to like, if you're lucky, 1% or 2% at most, um, generally you get even rarely you get anything more than that for a uh, um, US dollar. But on the DeFi itself, there are protocols offering up to like 20%. They are. And it's guaranteed to pay out. Of course, would it be sustainable? That is the next question uh, to be answered, right? A lot of, that's where the debate happens, right? Whether it's going to be a Ponzi or not. But there are people getting paid and the protocol is worth billions. So it takes billions of money before it get bankrupt, right? In the sense, perspective, right? But would it happen? It might, right? So it's still very risky. But is your money on the blockchain? Yes, you can redraw anytime you want. So, I mean, that is actually the gap between like the crypto market and the traditional market. So that is really create a very strong incentive for people to get into the crypto market, right? Because of the return is just incredible. That's number one. Number two, right? For either for retail investors or for professional investors, I think DeFi is going to create, uh, again, uh, a, a very uh, important tool to help people to get into uh, crypto. To give you an example, uh, I'm, I'm, I've created a product called uh, DAO Ventures. We are an automated DeFi fund manager platform. What, what, what does it mean by that? Right? It's a long word. So essentially, we are creating an automated ETF fund manager that happens and works on the blockchain itself. The second part is we do not touch the money. We are non-custodial. There's no counterparty risk because everything is on the blockchain. Unless the blockchain is down, right? So that is the second uh, benefit for the, um, uh, the investors. And the third one is all the uh, strategies and the code are transparent on the blockchain, which means that if you do not need to trust any of the developers to do it, you, what you need to do is to get an auditor or somebody who have read the code to do it. But of course, not everyone can read code, right? So that's why they still need to have a um, you know trustable auditor team that is licensed and compliant, right? And that is where I think the next DeFi will be. Because to get the mass majority of the market, like anybody with an app to invest, you need to be compliant, right? That's how, you know, you need to be licensed, right? That's how you want to get the money. Otherwise, it's a bunch of geeks and nerds, right? Who are using like inter blockchain money to transfer everywhere. It doesn't make sense, right? It's just a number on the blockchain, right? And the cryptocurrency. So, um, and I think that that is actually what will happen. 
um, it's really happening because I'm really building it and we already have like uh, customers right, who are actually depositing the money through us and making money. Um, and personally myself, I have invested my own money into my own product as well. Why? It's very simple, right? I'm creating my own startup and my own business. And imagine that I don't, I'm not eating my own dog food, right? In the sense that I don't have skin in the game. And this doesn't sound right, right? So I invest my own money there and like it's profitable. It's making money for me. So that create passive income for me, right? So instead of like me go and find like, uh, you know, have to look at the dashboard every day or have to look at which uh, token to buy and have to time the market. I'm a passive investor myself because as I mentioned, I'm an engineer. I'm not a trader. What do I do? I think my cryptocurrency that I made and then I just deploy into my own strategy and make money for me. Even when I'm sleeping. That is what the luxury I'm creating uh, through Dow Ventures. Victor, what is your definition of ETF for your application? Because I think it's a little bit different in that an ETF, in my mind, usually it's stocks, sometimes it's stocks and bonds, but it's trading on a stock exchange. So I think this is a little bit different, right? Yep. Uh, it's different because we are doing, we're not in the traditional market, right? but it's on crypto. We give an example, right? What we created, we actually have an index fund. Um, the ETF is something that to be created. So essentially what will happen is that we create strategies just like a fund manager would do. And the strategies are tested, right? Back tested to say that, hey, uh, you, i give you an example. We actually have a strategy called uh, Crypto Market Weighted Index. It's the same as investing into SPY or S&P 500 except that this is actually based on the crypto market weight. So around 40% will on Bitcoin, around, uh, you know, the balance right will be split to the top 10 of the cryptocurrencies. And we create that strategies that happen automatically. So from the investor point of view, they do not even need to think about it. Because as we know, right, in the, in, in the S&P 500, if you cannot beat the market, just invest into the beta, which is the uh, SPY, right, and the, uh, the market index itself. Similar to it, when you de de deploy the cryptocurrency into that strategy, you automatically invest for you based on that portfolio composition. The, the, the investors don't even need to know it, right? They just deploy the money, you invest for them into that composition, and you rebalance itself every three months, right? What will happen is, there's additional benefit that I did not mention, right? What does it mean by that? You see, in, in traditional market, right, the dividend will come in uh, regularly, maybe not even now. But for crypto, right, there's a terminology called yield farming. What yield farming does is that when you invest through these protocols and into this crypto market weighted index, that protocol, the exchanges, will give you additional money because you are signing up to them. You're deploying money to them. That's why they're giving you in terms of their profit sharing reward to you as well as a, as an investor. We call it as yield farming. So essentially, right, and it's all automated on the blockchain. I don't even need to do anything. It's all written in the code. So what happens is the code will automatically not only rebalance itself every three months, but it will take that profit fees generation to be reinvested into the strategy itself. So essentially what you do not only you will be able to invest based on the, uh, uh, the strategies, but you'll be able to get the yield as an incentive as well. And you will always outperform the beta just because of this reason. Because if you're investing yourself, you're just buying the tokens, right? And you're like, hey, I'm just going to hold it, right? But through us, because we automate everything for you, you're going to take the additional trading fees and the yield itself to be reinvested into the strategy. So essentially, you will actually make more money than just holding it. So you will outperform the beta. So that is the, the index fund. As for the ETF, right? You're right. We are not selling bonds and securities, right? The ETF is actually all on cryptocurrency, but there's a token that represents that strategy. So the users could use that token to actually trade it across any other uh, exchanges to represent the, your share of that, you know, the fund itself, uh, the index fund, right? The ETF fund. But Everything right now is only on crypto related index fund or the strategies are on crypto. There's no nothing to relate to the stock. There's nothing relates to the commodities in the real world yet or the bonds, nothing. It's just all on crypto. And which is why I say that in the next five years, all of this new existing traditional finance, when the breach will happen, right? And then those uh, market will come into crypto, right? Because it's 24 seven and traders love to make money 24 seven, right? And then what will happen is that the market will continue to grow because there's much more of this traditional market and instruments and product 
that has not yet to come to cryptocurrency um, and this all doesn't achieve the scale required yet. Is yield farming in liquidity mining the same thing? Um, similar. Um, yeah, similar term, right? So liquidity mining, you're putting your liquidity, you get more tokens, yield farming, I'm putting my liquidity, I'm getting some yield and a farm for you, right? Essentially, it's just a different terminology. And what is staking? Oh, <laughs> very interesting question. So, um, li okay, liquidity mining, right, is that I'm taking my... Um, my capital, my liquidity, right, which is a U US dollar denominated or any other currency, that I took that, then I deploy into exchange or deploy into a fund manager, they help me make more money by return, right, because I'm giving them the money, they will give me additional uh, liquidity money in yield farming. As for staking, right, is that I'm taking that, that yield that I have is in that protocol token, I use that and I stake it, then I get more in return. So the slight difference is that the liquidity mining is I'm just putting my liquidity, which is my Ethereum, my Bitcoin, my USDC, you know, all these currencies, and I get more uh, token in return, right? But for staking is, generally I take a token that is the platform, uh, the platform's token. If I stake it, right, then I get more of it. So the reason why they do it is because of various reasons. For example, right, uh, Ethereum is going to migrate their um, chain from being a proof of work computational chain, which is very uh, resource heavy, right? That's why people are saying that's very energy inefficient to proof of stake. So essentially what will happen to the proof of stake is they'll have to deploy the Ethereum as as, a, as staking. When you say stake it, right? Then they'll become a validator in the network because it's still, it's still a network, right? You, you still need to like solve the cryptocurrency problem. But the difference is that instead of using a machine to solve it, now, as long as you are a stakeholder in the network, you deploy 32 Ethereum into a node, then you become staking. But of course, if you do that, then you'll be locking your capital in there, right? What's the purpose? The purpose is that they'll give you the reward in terms of the yield from the staking. With the yield farming, what is the average yield that you're getting? Because I think th there are different variables, right? It depends <laughs> where you're doing it. Because I don't know. In essence, in those instances, whether it's um, yield farming or liquidity mining, is your money, you're, you're kind of serving like a bank? You're serving more like a market maker. Actually. Market maker. Yeah, because you're you are using your capital right to market make in the sense that you're deploying your capital to get more in return right so you're a liquidity provider which is why in, you see that is the problem with DeFi. there are too many jargons how we can expect the normal people to understand what is lp what is taking a liquidity mining you know the, when they when they listen to that they're like i'm not going to participate right so that is the problem with DeFi. but anyway to answer your question right um the range of like the yield in like the staking and the liquidity mining right ranges from like a few percent to the crazy one it could be up to like a thousand percent they are but as the golden olden wisdom the higher the higher risk you take and the chances that that will actually disappear right it's just the same thing so but apparently a lot of speculators and gamblers love it you know it's the same like in the real world right Trying to talk in to talk the sense into some trader in the real world to say that hey, can you trade your stocks or your commodities with hundred x leverage? That happens in crypto all the time. A lot of people just get liquidated, right? Because like oh, the 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 price of the volatility just drop and then they lost everything, right? There are a lot of people like that in crypto. They just love to gamble, right? They are not investors; <laughs> they are speculators and gamblers. So yeah, um, the yield could be ranged from like few percent up to like a thousand to even ten thousand. They are. But high risk, high return. So that's how I see it. Yeah. You have several strategies today. I don't even know how many. It seems like quite a few. You have over a dozen? Like for for your strategies, what kind of yield are you trying to get back? Are you trying to have a more conservative view? I'm just kind of curious what the goal is or what the target is that you're trying to um, you know, get back for the reinvestment. For me, I think um, it's actually more about the risk uh, and then uh, the market. I think that is actually the more important uh, things to look at. We started Dow Ventures last year, right? Which is why all the strategies that we developed is actually based on the bull market. I mean, there are some conservative return, but the interest is very low, right? But we 
focus a lot of our effort and development into the riskier and uh, more bull market strategy. For example, we have one strategy, aside from the strategy I was talking about, the crypto market weighted index, that will happen very nicely if there's a bull market because you just do not need to time the market, you just buy and it will work for you, right? Dollar cost averaging, you still work. But at the current bearish market, we are trying to create something more uh, stable that provides yield uh, at the lesser volatility, maybe even zero volatility uh, with, in, uh, with lesser impermanent loss, right? So you do not even lose money, right? So basically, it's a stable coin, you deploy it, you make yield for you. Um, and that could give you up to like 10%. Um, it's, it's very low by crypto nature, right? But in the real world, they say that you're crazy, right? <laughs> uh, but um, so that's how I, I look at it. So the, the the way we think about it is very simple. So the risk is that in regardless of market, right, we, we will create strategies based on like a high risk, medium risk, and low risk. So low risk, definitely um, less impermanent loss, and then you get lower interest in return. But high risk, right, you deploy into like metaverse strategy, for example. We have a strategy that is actually was very volatile, but very profitable at the end of last year. It's called metaverse strategy. What will happen is that you deploy the money, you actually invest into various metaverse tokens for you. Instead of you going to do it yourself, that strategy will invest into various metaverse tokens. It was proven true. At the bull market, that strategy yield me 80% in three months. It's less than, less than three months, I mean 80%. But of course, when the price came crashing down, then, you know, of course, I lose money, right? Because at the peak, I did not sell and then it came down, right? But every strategy that we have developed is actually mirroring how we see the market will be. So, for example, you think that market metaverse is going to be the, 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 the narrative for the next five years, it's a no-brainer, right? Instead of like just buy and hold, just put it in there, it work for you, right? Passive income. So even with dollar cost averaging, you're still able to, uh, you know, have uh, uh, additional income from that. Um, but for risk, that is from the risk and narrative point of view. The second one is actually market timing. So currently, the, because of the market is slightly bearish, we are actually doing in-house to make sure that we are actually doing some low, uh, low risk strategy such as the stable coin i was talking about invest in the stable coin you know almost zero risk of uh, losing the money and then after that uh, there's still some risks here and there right? there's no guarantee but the uh, return is still higher than you know putting into a bank so that's what we do with the current market talk a little bit about this dow golden cross strategy yeah <laughs> um so golden cross strategy is actually a Bull, bull, bullish and bearish market strategy. Right? What happens is that um, we are using a 50 EMA uh, versus uh, 200 EMA, right? It's just a trading indicator. So when uh, there's a golden cross, right? When it's, you know, we use that as a trading indicator, if it's, if it's bullish, right? You actually invest more into like if and BDC, right? Instead of holding into a stable coin. So that's an exponential moving average. Yes. Yep. Um, then after that, uh, when it's bearish, then you just invest into a stable coin. You automatically switch for you. It's very simple, right? It's just that uh, we think that it's kind of like, yeah, meaningful. So, um, but of course, that strategy doesn't have a lot of traction uh, because as I mentioned, right, we realize where the problem is. The problem is even we have a good strategy, the fundamental remains the same. It's actually the ma mass retail market we are targeting after. Because in the crypto space, there's one thing that is very prevalent, that the yield farmers and the liquidity miners will move away once you stop giving them liquidity. So giving them the incentive, which makes sense. I'm putting a, a hundred thousand or a million into your protocol that generates me this kind of amount of money, but I can get similar return or higher return at another platform. I'm just going to go there, right? Because it's permissionless. We're supposed to do so. So for us, right, we decided to actually make some changes to our business model. That is where I think of being an entrepreneur and the businessman having the conviction, right, that, you know, it's still going to be the future, but we're going to be smart to make some changes to it. Uh, we recently, we got uh, accelerated and incubated by uh, accelerator in, uh, in Dublin called Techstars. Uh, they believe in us and they invest into us. And uh, yeah, our proposition is very simple. We are going to get ourselves compliant and then we will actually get uh, more mass market to invest into our strategies through a compliant method. So instead of a wild, wild west, now we are regulated right, even by the law. So that will actually bring in more confidence to more people to say that, hey, this company is regulated. Yeah, I can put in $100 a month. And those kind of customers generally, they are not very, um, what do you call that, um, more loyal. <laughs> They'll stick to your platform because like, hey, you're giving me good return. I'm just going to stick with you. Instead of like, I'm just going to jump to another platform to offer me like 2% more, right? So those are the stuff that we are actually uh, changing at the top inches. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that. What does that mean? Does that 
does being compliant mean that you can approach banks or different clients of financial institutions? What does it mean to Dow Ventures? Well, as of the current, right, the majority, I would say majority uh, of the um, of the DeFi protocols are all unregulated, right? Because it's all on blockchain. Any developers anywhere in the world could just develop and deploy on the blockchain, just like us, right? Which means that there's no competitive advantage for us to compete with them because everyone, anyone can do it. But having compliant, which means that we need to follow the compliant process, right, of a uh, specific jurisdiction. Like, for example, right, being a hedge fund manager, the same thing. You need to go through and register a fund manager license in a specific jurisdiction, right, to actually able to receive the fund. Same thing with us. The only difference is that they are investing into traditional market, we are investing into DeFi. So that would actually give us and allow us to actually access more different customers than just the pure crypto DeFi customers. Example, once we do that, we were actually able to approach some of these, uh, you know, angels or family invest family uh, family funds right or those um you know health, wealthy individual high network individual who are holding money in crypto but they are like hey i want to invest in the DeFi, but i have to go to compliance process because i cannot be just redrawing my money by the bot coin base and invest right it doesn't make sense for them right so that compliant will give us the benefit and advantage to actually able to get those customers to invest through the ventures into DeFi. So then we will become a compliant platform right, to actually manage those monies. Interesting. So what should viewers and listeners, they got a lot of kind of history from you and hopefully a better understanding of DeFi and what why it's attractive to an investor. I mean, this is a world that sounds crazy, as you said, 10% in the DeFi area, they're like, oh, that's that's nothing. But <laughs> yeah. I look at my checking account interest, 10% is like a home run. <laughs> so so where crazy, are we yeah. going from here? Like, since you're both an engineer, a product guy, what direction, like what trends do you see possibly emerging that people should really be paying attention to and that might help guide them in their getting involved in decentralized finance? Of course. Um, there are two types of um, customers, right? Or, you know, listeners to, to any of the content uh, that we need to be aware of, right? Again, non-financial advice, right? I'm not a registered financial planner advisor. Um, but there's a two type of uh, listeners right one of them is actually people who actually have no awareness or just like heard about blockchain and crypto and bitcoin um for for those type of investors and customers i'll use the traditional proven method just dollar cost average and then you are still able to you know beat the market right because you do not need to be an expert you just need to dollar cost average into DeFi, and then you're still able to make the return that everyone is looking for and the risk is less and of course, I'm not asking people to, like, hey, mortgage your house, sell your car and put into DeFi, right? That is like gambling. <laughs> no, be a responsible investor, right? Just take like X percentage of your, your monthly pay or like your investment, deploy some of them into Bitcoin, buy some into DeFi, and you still outperform the market, right? Because that is where the world is heading, right? That's number one. And number two, right? For slight people who are slightly more uh, complex, um, who wanted to get more like alpha from this kind of uh, um, investment in DeFi, I think the DeFi is still continue to grow for the next five years, as I mentioned. So there's going to be alpha and there's going to be emerging new technology uh, or new sector that will happen in the crypto space and Web3 space itself. So it's more about like keeping the ear to the ground and like, you know, just hang out more in crypto space to understand what is actually happening there. And then they will be able to find and discover some gems because that's how I think it will happen the same thing as investing into tech companies. Um, I think the, the market has changed as well. In the olden days, right, people invest into IPO, but nowadays, right, IPO is an exit liquidity for a lot of uh, investors in, in the in the VC space, right? So generally getting into those deals, right, early on into those projects, right, is actually going to be um, life-changing for a lot of investors. So depending on the type of investors, um, for normal people, as I mentioned, dollar cost averaging uh, generally will not go wrong. Don't gamble, <laughs> don't do leverage, just dollar cost average. And for like some people who look for alpha, and I think that DeFi is going to still be there, be here, and it's still going to grow. Um, and that is where the return will come from. But eventually, I would say that that 
alpha, right, or that gap, right, or the arbitrage between like the potential profit is going to go down. Because crypto and market is still growing. That's why there's such opportunity, right? But another five years down the road, when it's winner, I doubt that you'll be able to enjoy the kind of profit, right, uh, and kind of the return. Uh, yeah, so um, that's what I would say to a majority of the, um, the, the, the investors. Yeah, earlier in the curve, you have faster growth, but higher risk. Yes. And as, as things mature, then less risk. So the return, I guess the return profile <laughs> follows that. Yep. What did you learn in the like crypto bear market of 2018? And, you know, if, if you're going to be a long-term investor in dollar cost average, this is just... It just seems to be a much more volatile asset class. So you have to be prepared for that in the short term. How do you avoid getting a stomach ache, Victor? Um, which is why conviction is very important, right? <clears throat> I used that, uh, that word um, uh, earlier and I'm still using it, right? I, I understand how technology works, right? Which is why I was saying that if you look at it purely from a financial investment point of view, yes, it might be too much to take a risk. but I, I come from my, I, I cannot comment for everyone, but I come from the background of like technologies, right? And I look at how many multi-billion dollar industry are created from these technology changes. And it's proven, right? It's not something that is extraordinary. So because of that, even if it's spare market, right? There will be cycles. It's just like the same as financial institution, financial investment, right? There's going to be cycle. And every cycle, there's going to be something new that comes out, right? Even in financial, right? For crypto, for uh, the, the crypto is, again, um, there are two parts. The first part is that, as I mentioned, looking at the wave of crypto, right? Again, the next wave is going to come in the next two, three years at most, right? Now, depending on the market condition. But again, you can see slightly rebound even this week, right? You'll be surprised. There's a war happening in like Ukraine and Russia, but the market is like rebounding. I have no idea sometimes how the market works, right? But that's the beauty of it. Don't think about all these things and just dollar cost average, right? And you're still able to make money, right? So that's one. Um, that's how I see the bear market. And the second one, right, is actually, um, um, I see that I've been through this process, right? I've seen it. There's like multiple bear market in the Bitcoin history. And every bear market, there's going to be like sayers and ah, say, naysayers and saying that, oh, this is the chicken has come back to the hand and get roasted, right? And then, you know, the things is going to die. We have heard that narrative is like, I don't know, hundreds of times from different media, right? Same thing as uh, Bitcoin banning, um, China banning Bitcoin. That narrative has been like used and reused and reused like over the years, right? And today, Bitcoin is still around. So the, that's the beauty of this, right? So um, it's just that because I understand from a fundamental perspective and I know that crypto and Web3 is going to be here uh, disrupting the financial market and create a better um, process for it. That's why I know that it's going to be used for it. And because of there's a use for it, and then I don't think the industry will die. The only question is, if you want to be a little bit more alpha driven, you want to invest in a specific token and coin, you might lose everything, right? Because you're investing in a specific one. But if you don't lose everything, just invest into the, into the overall and you'll be fine, right? So um, that's how I see the pair market. And 2018 to 2020, the two years pair market, I remember uh, Ethereum went low to the lowest of $80. And Bitcoin went to like lowest around $3,500. And everyone was like, oh my God, panic. This is the end of crypto. I I sometimes I feel, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a superman and like I, I, I'm bulletproof. I'm not. You're human. I feel very nervous as well, you know. But again, right, just by understanding that fundamental and says that this is the future, right? And again, smart people were like, hey, just dollar cost average and then they'll still be able to make lots, lots of a return, right, from that. $80, can you imagine? Just, just imagine Ethereum at $80, right? Today it's trading at like um, $3,000. Yeah, you know, just don't know how to explain it. And that is on Ethereum. I'm not talking about even other smaller coins, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the power of conviction and having a longer term view <laughs> to really stick to it. With your strategies, what are your fees for the different ETFs? Um, we have uh, our strategies 
right now, I mean, we are changing, but our original strategies that we have right now is very simple. We only take 1% on the deposit, which is the fees we cover for all the operational costs and stuff, um, just to make sure that we are covered on our, the because it's on the blockchain, right? We got to pay for the fees on the blockchain. That is for that. And then there is a watermark profit sharing, watermark that we take right, uh, based on the profit generated, uh, which is 20%. So it's one and 20. But we are thinking because you want to, once we have the license, right? Um, we are applying for the compliance license. I think most probably you might do and reduce it to 0 20. Because I feel that the market is growing. There's no point to really think about profit at the beginning but focus more on growing the market share and get more customers. And I think that as long as we reduce the barrier for entering, um, I think that is actually a very strong proposition. So I think something like around 0 20, right now it's 120, which is 1% deposit and 20% watermark profit share, maybe to 0% on deposit to 20% uh, on the profit share might be a very compelling uh, proposition for a lot of investors. Mm, so worth watching. Yeah. Do investors, are they putting in crypto? Like new investors that come in, is it is it purely crypto? Are they coming in with Bitcoin or Ethereum? Or are they putting in US dollars or different currencies? How does it work? Currently, because we are not compliant, as I mentioned, right, we are non-custodial, we are DeFi player, we cannot take any fiat right in the beginning, right now. So that is why we are pivoting and changing it to be compliant so that we can take fiat and US dollar so that they can actually transfer their bank account and we can take credit card as a deposit. We can do that, right? But right now, as of it, we can't. So right now, we're only taking the stable coins, which is the USDT, the USDC, the DAI. Those are the stable coins, right? And the barrier is this. They still need to understand how to use that crypto wallet. <laughs> Again, another barrier, right? You have to teach people how to use the crypto wallet. So which is why we realized, right? I mean, we have to pivot and change. Having that this model right is not going to bring in new customers to the DeFi right, which what I was talking about. The next five years is going to be bull run for retail market. So having a compliant, our 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 mission and our vision is very simple. We just want to have a customers to have an app that connect to their bank account or their credit card or their PayPal, and then they just deposit five hundred dollars automatically invest for them into the DeFi strategies. Done. That should be that how simple it is, right? And that is where we are trying to go to. Makes sense. Yeah, you want to create the Robinhood app of DeFi. DeFi it yes. sounds like. Well, thank you for sharing all this information with us and the Dow Ventures story. Tell the Inspired Money, actually, before we get there, <laughs> I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Um, so my definition of success, right, is to create the impact um, not in monetary value. I mean, it could be one of the OKR or the KPI I set it for myself. But the thing that makes me wake up in the morning and driven every day, right, is actually not about the, the numbers. For me, it's actually about how many customers would be satisfied to, um, you know, invest into DeFi or get into DeFi uh, because of us. I think the more happy customers that we created and the more money we make them to help them to make from DeFi, right, I think that is what judge our success. And that is what I look for uh, as my barometer of success. Because you can make all the money yourself, but everyone else around you is, you know, that integrity and the character I was talking about, right? You can make all the money yourself, but you're gonna be unhappy because you'll be like watching all your money like hawk, right? And I'm like, who is gonna take money from me? Is the government gonna tax me and stuff? No, I mean, what's the point? If I'm able to help 10,000 people to be happy in their investment and they're gonna make like 10, 20% return over their money, 10,000 people is gonna have a happy smile saying that, hey, Dow Ventures and Victor has helped me to achieve my financial goal. That is what I want. And that what defines success for me. Well, thank you for sharing your story. And tell the Inspired Money listeners and viewers where to follow you and find out more about Dow Ventures. Yeah, so um, to um, the we actually live uh, on the website called DowVentures.co. Um, there's another competitor <laughs> called DowVentures.com, right? But anyway, um, DowVentures.co is our website. You can always find us on the on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Uh, our Twitter is called VenturesDow. Um, it's the other way around. Not sure why Twitter did that. Um, or follow me on, uh, on on Twitter. My handle uh, is called Victor, V-I-C-T-O-R, Lee, L-E-E, J-W. 
So I'm available on all these channels. And then if you have, if you have time, just ping me and I'm more than happy to answer some of the questions uh, that you might have about DeFi. Um, you know, really love to help more people to get into DeFi. Thanks so much, Victor. So what was your favorite inspired money moment? I like what Victor said about having conviction in Web3, DeFi, and crypto. Despite the booms and the busts, and that included some violent bear markets, dollar cost averaging is important. That combined with not betting too much can go a long way to protecting you from the downside. But if you're a believer in this trend, benefiting from potential upside. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please post a comment or share it in the Inspired Money Makers Facebook group at inspiredmoney.fm slash Facebook. Thank you for tuning in to the end. Be sure to subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. It's investment focused and the Running Meet investment team highlights data news and events that we think are worth sharing. Subscribe at inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. It's free and informative. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.